a very healing experience for me. We did this trip, um, and then going back to Quezon, my son said it was like, um, he said it was like hallowed ground. He, he, I think he said he, he felt is that he, he, he felt death in the air. Um, it was his perception, of course. For me, um, Quezon and Camp Carroll it being bombarded and all that stuff, to be there with it totally quiet without ever having to worry about any incoming rounds or something, that was eerie for me as well. We grew up on the southwest side of town, which was a predominantly Italian neighborhood. So we knew a lot of the neighbors on our street and throughout the whole neighborhood. I uh, didn't like school at all. I didn't do well at school. However, I did excel in art, and I was in NDCC, which um, National Defense Cadet Corps, which is like ROTC. Um, and I excelled in that. I was best drill cadet at uh, Auburn High School uh, two years in a row. With that, um, I decided to make the military career. In NDCC, I was focused on making it, uh, the military career, and I looked at the branches of service and I just felt that the Marine Corps was the best trained, and um, that's, that's where I decided to go. They have one major interest in common, a desire to be Marines. They will devote all their time to the business of becoming members of the most spirited fighting team on Earth, the United States Marine Corps. They, they have this tactic where you get there when it's dark. So when you get off the bus, they have these yellow footprints and they are on you like a wet shirt <laughs> from that moment on. Um, so it was kind of a, a culture shock, you know, from civilian life. But everybody kind of adapted to it as, as best they could some washed out, some didn't. Before they leave recruit training, however, they will be molded into United States Marines. I had experience with marching and using the rifle uh, in high school. And one of the things, it's almost like prison. You don't want to stand out. You want to blend in. Um, so my goal was to blend in and not to look too good and when it came to marching. I just tried to maintain and uh, just not get in trouble. Didn't want to stand out, and when we did um, bayonet training um, with rifles, uh, they, call, they, they have these things called pugil sticks, and it's a big long stick with pads on each end, and you would use it like a rifle. Um, and we would fight each other with football helmets on. And what happened to me was our sticks went like this and kind of sliced against each other. And of course it came down on both my thumbs. So both of my thumbs got broken. But I never went to sick bay or anything. I just kind of dealt with it because I didn't want to stand out. I was focused mainly on becoming a Marine. Um, Unlike the other branches of service, you're really not a Marine until you pass boot camp. And then you get your uniform and you're called a Marine then. And until after boot camp, when we went to um, um, individual infantry training that all Marines go through. Training as a Marine, learning the ways of a rifleman, absorbing the tradition and the heritage acquiring the fierce pride and stubborn drive that have always meant Marine.
so during that training, when we started to train uh, in guerrilla warfare, that's when it kind of struck home that I was actually going to go into a war. It kind of, I kind of understood that, yeah, I was headed for Vietnam and I was headed to uh, a combat kind of a situation because my primary job was machine gunner. We did a two-week uh, machine gun school uh, where we fired M60 machine guns from the prone, kneeling, standing from the hip. Um, and uh, I had a secondary job. Uh, you know, they, they uh, run you through a battery of tests um, academically as well. And uh, for some reason, they thought that I would make a good interpreter. So they sent me to a Vietnamese language school for, I believe that was like three months before I actually went to Vietnam. That was, <laughs> that was a drunken bash. <laughs> Um, nobody cared because what would they do, send you to Vietnam? I mean, you know, we didn't care. So uh, they gave us reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders so you could record your voice, and we never even used them. Uh, it was all about partying and drinking and um, passing inspection at the end of the week so you could go on liberty on the weekends. Um, nobody studied. <laughs> But unbelievably, um, it did somewhat stick. They sent us home for a couple of weeks on leave. And then I came back and you basically, whenever you're moving, they assign you to like a, a transit barracks. Um, so as, as guys, uh, come into the base, they go to this transit barracks, and you wait until you assemble enough men to make a company or whatever they're planning. Um, so after leave, I came back to a transit barracks in California <clears throat> and just waited, I don't, know, I don't know, a couple weeks maybe. And then we uh, flew out of uh, California. I think it was out of L.A., uh, from there to uh, Okinawa, uh, one night overnight in Okinawa, and then we flew to Da Nang on a Pan Am commercial jet. Um, I arrived in Da Nang, which is a huge base, was a huge, huge base, a lot of transit going on, guys coming in, going home, guys going on R&R, &R, coming back. First day is pretty, you know, you're really not with your unit yet, that kind of thing. Being processed, uh, shots, um, malaria pills, uh, getting your gear. So that it, I'd say that probably lasts a couple of days, just getting processed into the country and getting to where you had to go. They gave me a, an envelope and it had a fraction written on the outside of the envelope, which I didn't know what it meant. It was 3 slash 26. And later on, I found out that that was 3rd Battalion, 26 Marines. So that was where I was assigned. And they were working out of a, a town called Fubai. Um, in Fubai, um, I joined this, uh, was Mike Company, and um, I, I went in as a machine gunner, and um, we worked uh, one operation there, uh, a few weeks out in the bush. Um, we took some, some fire from a sniper, my first time in a combat situation, um, which I didn't realize at the time because I was new. Um, but uh, some Viet Cong fired a few shots at us. We all hit the deck, and uh, within seconds, my platoon leader was up standing, walking around. I thought he's nuts, but I didn't know at the time, but they just hit and run. They took off, so um, that was my first 
uh, experience with gunfire shooting at me. At, uh, at night, if you're on a perimeter, then you have sectors of fire. So you would only fire in a certain direction. And the bunker next to you would overlap their fire. Um, the thing about a machine gun is that there's a tracer round. I think it's every six rounds, I believe. Um, and they say that the life expectancy of a machine gunner in a firefight is like 30 seconds because they're going to look for where that machine gun's at and they're going to fire at the machine gun. Um, I was lucky enough uh, not to, to have anything like that happen. I mean, machine gunners are relied upon because of the heavy firepower that you can put out. The war had begun to escalate and uh, you know, I was there in 67 and 68 at the height of the war. And um, our company commander told us that we were going to be uh, heading up to Quezon and we were going to be working out of Quezon. Um, once we got to Quezon, um, we were dealing with more the NVA and uh, some of the mountain guards up in the mountains that didn't speak uh, Vietnamese. Um, and less Viet Cong. You know, Viet Cong were just like farmers by day. So they weren't very good shots, uh, whereas the NVA, um, they were trained military and um, a lot harder to deal with. Overall, my experience in, in Nam was going on these search and destroy missions um, that lasted like a month. So we'd go out in the bush and we'd sweep through a, a, a valley or something like that. We'd go from village to village looking for the enemy, um, looking for um, things like an abundance of, of rice or something in a village. So we knew then that the enemy was using that village as a spot to get food. You know, our orders were burn the village down. So you get all the people out, they become refugees, and they call it a Zippo raid. You take your Zippo lighter out and you start burning everything. Um, the people you felt sorry for them because, you know, they're, they're being displaced. But at the same time, they were just after our food. They wanted our sea rations. And when we got into a uh, populated area, you never knew who the enemy was. They could strap a grenade on a little girl and send that little girl into your circle of friends and it'd blow up. We would sweep through during the day and then we'd find a, some high ground at, in the evening. Everybody would dig a foxhole. We'd set up a perimeter, protect that area that you're at. And then at night, we would send out ambushes. We'd send out, we'd go on daily patrols, and then at night, we'd go out on ambushes. But everybody didn't go on an ambush. You know, just selective different squads that would go out and cover different areas. Um, Generally speaking, I'd say I probably went on an ambush maybe three, four times a week. After the 30 days, then we would, we would get helicoptered back to Quezon Air Base, um, get resupplied, get our mail, hot shower. But most of the time, we lived in the bush for the 13 months that I was there. As Marines push through the jungle, they must overcome natural obstacles as well as the enemy hiding someplace in the dense growth. Pumping a lot of gear. Um, the cartridge belt would dig into your hips. You'd have bruises on your hips. Uh, you'd have cuts all over your forearms from the elephant grass, and those cuts would get infected. Um, your feet were constantly wet. Um, leeches 
um, things like that on a day-to-day -day ba basis. Uh, it got up to close to 120 degrees. Um, so your utility jacket that you wore um, would get stiff with your sweat, the salt in your, in your body. Um, and you developed, um, you kind of become the earth, you know. You, you don't smell after a while. Um, you get to that point like an animal. Um, your, because the enemy is out there, your, your sense of hearing, smell, sight, all peak, especially at night. You get kind of like night vision. You can see a lot better at night. Um, so your body, your, you, you begin to adapt to the environment. Um, but you'd go, you'd walk forever, and you'd never hit, take any enemy fire. Uh, they'd know where you're at during the day. So they say, you know, we own the day, they own the night. Um, and mosquitoes, I mean, you know, just, it was unbearable as far as that goes. But we had, you know, mosquito repellent and things like that. Of course, you put that on, and the enemy could smell you. Um, so that's kind of what a, a, a day in the bush was like. Every now and then, uh, you know, you take a break um, and uh, have a cigarette, um, maybe try to write a letter. But that was pretty tough because writing letters in the bush, um, how do you keep it dry? Um, when the monsoon season starts, it's just impossible. Um, try to keep a cigarette lit, you know, when it's pouring down rain and then you got a poncho on and stuff like that. So um, leisure time was cleaning weapons, making sure your weapon didn't get jammed, stuff like that. Um, and a lot of rumors talk about where we're going next, um, what the enemy force is like where we're going, that kind of thing, what the terrain is like. Those are kind of the things that we talked about. We talked about home, being homesick, girlfriends, stuff like that. We had been out for close to 30 days, all looking forward to going back. We got up early that morning and we humped to a spot where the choppers were gonna pick us up. Um, so that morning, everybody was kind of relaxed. We were looking forward to going back, getting a hot shower, getting our mail. And um, it was about 8.30 in the morning. And uh, we are, I, I, I guess I, I have to, to back up a step and tell you that um, they took me off the machine gun. Uh, I guess we, we must have gotten more guys coming over that that had machine gun as their primary job. So they relieved me of the machine gun and made me a radio operator. So now I've got this radio on my back with the handset and carrying a 45 pistol instead of a machine gun, which was, I didn't like that very much because I go from all this firepower down to having a you know, pistol with eight rounds in it. So, um, but, we, we started down this, uh, this ridge line. It was a path, all single file. And across from us was this other ridge line that the enemy was in, uh, in an ambush waiting for us. So the point man in my squad, who was about four guys in front of me, he um, halted everybody and he said he heard uh, safeties on their rifles being switched off. Um, and uh, just as he said that, uh, they opened up on us. And they just went right up the, the trail. So we jumped off the side of the trail and um, unfortunate for us, being the first squad, we got pinned down. So the guys behind us couldn't shoot without hitting us. 
and we were just taking all this fire. Um, it was me and two other guys were the only three out of the first squad of 14 guys that lived. Um, one guy got shot in the hand. He lost uh, these fingers, um, but he lived. I got shot just above the boot and the shin, um, and uh, it just kind of flipped me over when I got hit. And another guy took a, sh a round in the shoulder and somewhere down in the side above his hip, and he survived. Um, and uh, we called in uh, choppers, uh, so they would came in and flanked. And I think they, they fired some rockets, and I think they might have hit some of our guys too uh, from a friendly fire. Um, but I got, I got um, a, a small, very small scrape across my forearm from a piece of shrapnel. Um, and uh, the, the shot in the leg, uh, that one went uh, down to the bone. It kind of grazed across and it made a hole. Um, you could see the bone and it was about uh, two and a half inches or three inches uh, in diameter. So they weren't able to close it. Um, so they, they closed it to within a gap of about like so and then put three stitches across it. And then they had to do a relaxing incision on the side to relax the skin again. And uh, they had, you know, after being wounded, they shipped me down south in, in country to a place called Chulai where I was in a hospital there, kind of a field hospital. Um, and they, uh, they dressed it there, they cleaned it up, and uh, that's where I recovered, but it got infected. And you know, if you've ever had any kind of a wound in the lower extremity, you know, as soon as you stand up, all that blood goes right down to that, and it hurt like heck. Um, so having to get on crutches and go three steps down out of the hooch and walk down a dirt road to go to a head to take a crap was a nightmare. Um, and then getting back in the bed and all that stuff. Um, so I was in the hospital like for 50 days um, recovering from that. But when I was done, they sent me back to my unit again. That was just kind of the standard for radio operators. Uh, they weren't expected to, to really put out a lot of firepower. They, their main thing was communication. And I really enjoyed that because I kind of knew what was going on. You know, I could talk to the other squads. I could talk to the platoon leader. Um, the choppers, I would, I would call in choppers all the time for resupply and for medevacs on the AM band. Uh, and one time I had the opportunity to call in jets. Um, on a, uh, we, we had spotted some uh, uh, gooks on a ridge line. Uh, we had snipers with us and they spotted them sitting there eating rice and stuff. And uh, they said, you want to call in jets? So I flipped to the FM band. So we asked them to drop a VT round, which is a, a I think it's a 250-pound bomb that, that explodes up in the air, so it sends the shrapnel all down on troops in the open like. Um, and then just for kicks, we had them come back and drop napalm on the bridge line and just sprayed it all across them. Well, then the Jets, they want to know how many kills they got. So they're asking me on the radio, and we're trying to figure out from the snipers with the scopes looking um, so we report back, I think they had 12 kills or something like that. And then that was it. I thought they were gone. Well, here comes these guys <laughs> flying right over the top of us. I mean, treetop level. And they came right over the top and they did a victory roll. And they're upside down waving to us <laughs> as they peeled off. It was a thrill to watch that. 
<coughs> and then being able to communicate with them, you know, from the jets, it, it gives you the feeling, and I've got, I had the same feeling whenever I call in choppers to, to, to fire rockets. Um, you, you get the feeling that you have that, that power, that, that uh, weaponry yourself, like you're shooting it. Um, it's kind of an awesome feeling to have that much firepower. The war was escalating and the NVA were about to attack Quezon. And they pulled me out, which I was thankful for that, but I didn't know that I was going to a place called Camp Carroll, which was, I think, six to nine miles away from Quezon. And they had these 175 howitzers there that the Army would fire. And they assigned me to um, a security platoon headquarters, 4th Marines. And our job was to guard the perimeter of that base. And they were trying to overrun us to get those 175s. Um, I was there from, I was there for three months, the last three months of my time in country. And uh, there was a mountain uh, that was nearby, it was called Dung Ha Mountain. And the enemy had six guns, and they would constantly barrage us with those. So you got in tune with listening for thumps off in the distance, like six thumps. And then you knew that those rounds were headed your direction. And they would sometimes walk them up the, the perimeter right through our bunkers. My bunker was blown up three times, and I was lucky enough not to be in it those three times. Um, but uh, the barrages kept coming in, and there were guys that were just getting to a point where they get claustrophobic. When you're in a hole, and it's night, and the bombs are dropping close enough that they're, they're actually, the shrapnel's hitting your bunker, you start getting closed in. Um, and a couple guys couldn't handle it, had to, had to leave. But that was probably the worst part of my war experience, was being a sitting duck. I'd much rather be out you know, get caught in an ambush or something where you can move <laughs> um, than to just sit there and wait for the next rounds to come in, you know. We stored our ammunition and stuff in the, in the bunker and everybody did these two-hour watches. Well, we'd gotten through the night, 7 a.m., watches stopped. Here comes my buddy up the hill and he's coming to get his friend who was on the last watch in the bunker to come uh, to go to Chow and he's tossing something up and down in his hand. And as he got closer, with, it's a grenade. Well, it wasn't a, a frag grenade, it was a, like a smoke grenade. Um, so he's tossing this up and down in his hand and he pulls the pin, he throws it in the bunker, rolls it down the, we had the, like these steps dug in it, rolled down inside the bunker and he was just joking, trying to smoke the other guy out. Well, what happened was it rolled up against a a uh, plastic sandbag full of machine gun ammo, Claymore mines, and a few grenades, and it caught fire. And uh, it, uh, it blew, it killed the guy inside pretty much instantly. Uh, the corpsman tried to put a tube down his throat to get him to breathe, but he, I think he was gone. And the guy that threw the the flare in there, the, the smoke grenade. Um, he realized what he had done after it caught fire. Um, so he ran in to get it, which was the worst thing he could have done was drag it outside and it would have blown outside and got a lot more guys. But he got halfway in and it blew him right in half. And he went flying out. Um, so he was pretty much dead instantly as well. Uh, kind of a bad situation because um, being on the perimeter, uh, we had all this concertina wire, which uh, it's like barbed wire in a, in a roll, and they pull it out like kind of like a slinky, and you put like three layers of that, uh, one on top of two, um, so the enemy can't get into your perimeter. Um, and uh, I mean, his flesh and stuff was stuck to the wire. We had to 
pick it off and put it in a body bag and send it home. I was wounded um, from that blast, uh, blew my eardrum out, and I caught small pieces of debris, shrapnel, sand, dirt, uh, just kind of sprayed the front of me. And the guy that was standing next to me was a little bit farther behind me. He caught it more in the face, upper upper chest. Um, ears ringing, you know, disoriented, concussion. Um, so I went off to sick bay a little bit to, to be checked out. And um, me and the other guy. Um, and once it was over, you know, I got light duty for a day because my ears were still ringing. Um, but back to the bunker, you know, you carry on, you just like nothing happened, basically. I was at Camp Carroll. We were getting hit. So uh, getting from my bunker to the chopper hoping that the chopper wouldn't take any rounds um, was stressful. I had to run to the chopper, um, get on that chopper and get out of range. But that's when it struck. Um, again, I, you know, your, your senses are all heightened. Uh, your sense of hearing and all this. Um, we were diving for holes for our life 48 hours before that. And for two weeks, I slept on the floor um, in front of the front door of my house, my mom and dad's house, because I didn't feel safe going upstairs to the second floor to sleep in a bed. Um, and I was used to sleeping on the ground, you know. I, I just couldn't. It just started a, every sound. I mean, my mom dropped a box on the kitchen floor. Some just like incoming. Um, dove for the ground. I was sitting on the couch, dove for the ground. Just instinct, you know. Um, so no decompression at all. Just plucked from the jungle. Boom, you're in the society now. After a year, after two to three solid months of being bombarded, um, boy, that was, that was hard to take. Again, when I came back, I wasn't getting out of the, the service. I was doing 30 days home for liberty, or leave, <coughs> and then back. So those 30 days, a couple of weeks, I was sleeping on the floor. My mom couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. Um, <clears throat> hanging with my friends. Um, they were all, all kind of uh, interested to, to hear the stories and stuff, but I wasn't willing to, to share any of that stuff. Um, I felt like I was, now I was 19, I felt like I was 40. So all of my friends seemed very immature. Um, so I just felt like I was not one of them anymore. I was different, you know. I first heard about the Harlem Veteran Project in the middle of sophomore year, and when I first heard about it, I was eager to learn more about it. As I found out more about the class, I knew that it was a class that I wanted to take, and I never had a doubt in my mind that I wanted to take it. When I got into the class on one of the first few days of school, Stingy and Noonan told us that it was not going to be like any other class, that we were going to have to put in a lot of hard work and it was going to be a very stressful process. We weren't learning from a textbook, we were learning from the stories that the veterans had shared with us. They told us that we were going to have to persevere in creating this documentary and we were going to have to overcome many obstacles. I chose John off of a list of veterans. I knew that he was in the Vietnam War and he was a machine gunner. I was so eager to learn more about his story. When creating the documentary, things kind of got a little stressful. I just had to remember that I had to keep my eye on the prize and remember what all of this was for. And that kept me going. And now that I'm finished with the documentary, it is the best feeling in the world. Um, 
the lessons that I've learned from the Harlem Veteran Project are something that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. I've created many friendships and I've learned so many things and I'm forever grateful for that. And for the things that John taught me, I am, words could not explain how grateful I am for that. I, every day I think about the things that he taught me and the things that I learned and I am so grateful for that. He taught me to have integrity and to fight for what I believe in. He opened my eyes in so many ways about the stories of veterans. Before I started this project, I didn't know half of the things I did. I've gained so much knowledge from this experience. I want to thank him for always responding to my countless emails when I needed help and had so many questions. I am forever grateful for that. And I will carry what he and the Harlem Veteran Project have taught me for the rest of my life.